Thank you very much. I'd like to share with you uh, some experiences I had in the last four years, uh, meeting people, traveling places, and creating stuff. The journey starts in the summer of 2010. I'm standing in the bayou. It's a place warm and wet like Hong Kong. And I'm waiting for the captain that will take me to the BP oil spill that was happening in the Gulf of Mexico. The silhouette that appears is a wheelchair. And the man doesn't have one leg that's injured, he has his two legs missing. As I help the captain being lowered down in the boat, he explains to me that he's lost his first leg in Hurricane Katrina, and he's lost the second leg trying to recoup and working really hard to you know, recover from, from, from the accident. And that the only thing that he has left now is to work to clean up the BP oil spill. I very candidly explained to him, listen, I'm coming from Boston, and uh, I'm building robots that will be very expensive, and eventually they will replace you. They will take a job away. And maybe I was very lucky that you didn't have legs to punch me in the face. <laughs> but following this conversation, I uh, they decided, decided to dedicate the two next years of my life, uh, my life, and I moved to New Orleans and started working on a BP Ospion. And this kind of image that you see is, is hard to forget. I've seen hundreds of men sacrificing their health and going to go and clean up the BP Ospion and only cleaning up only 3% of the oil that's on the surface. The oil is a man-made, uh, the OSP is a man-made uh, accident, but it's controlled by natural forces. The wind, the waves, and the currents are driving the oil. And so my first intuition is, what if we use these natural forces to sail up the wind and to intercept the oil that's drifting down the wind, pulling the same uh, oil absorbent? And so I started to develop some uh, sailing robots, and I accidentally developed the shape-shifting sailing robot. So it's a boat, that a shape, a shape shift, so actually it doesn't have a center board or rudder, the whole boat changes shape. So the, the boat is soft, and it's by changing the shape of the boat that you can direct it. It's got many new uh, physics properties in that it can sail more efficiently in high wind and also in, in low wind. You can control the trajectory more efficiently. But what's most interesting actually is when you are pulling something long and heavy, and when you are making a maneuver, when you're sailing up the wind or into the wind, at some point you're going to be facing the wind. So say the wind is coming this way, if you don't have wind in your sail, you're not going to have any thrusts. But with a, with a, with a boat that can curve, it's different. You can catch the wind as the, the hull itself is bending. That allows you to um, pull a lot of payload. So that was a cool idea, and I uh, started publishing it online as an open source technology. And what happened next is that actually an international community of scientists, engineers, inventors started to be really interested in this. And 10 of them committed to work in Rotterdam for after we fundraised on Kickstarter $30,000. So with this group of people, we developed a functional robot that's three meters long and that can pull 25 meters of oil absorbent. And that was a great victory because that's a technology that, that could really potentially work and, and really make a dent on the environmental problem. And so we had lots of media and also some interest from investor. An investor came and said that he would put 10,000 US dollar every month for 10% equity on the company. And he gave me a check, but I was waiting to cash it. And two months in, I started to build a team and rent a space, but he pulled off. So I had to decide either to pay my team or pay myself. So I paid the team and lost the house in which I was uh, staying. So I couch surfed for a couple of weeks, that became months, and eventually I became homeless. Uh, <laughs> I became homeless not because I couldn't find a job. I was actually teaching master's degree at Goldsmith University at the time, but not enough to pay a full rent in London. And so I had a very kind friend who allowed me to build a yurt on his rooftop. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so, I spent a month in the, the, in the shirt without insulation because at the first month, it was January 2012, it was either insulation or food. So the months were very, very cold. But in these very harsh moments, I was reminded of one of the greatest men that, that I've known. And I've actually never talked about him in public. This is, this is going to be the first time I ever talk about him. His name is Nathan Prashovnik. So he, he, once he was about my age, 23, he was going out and went for dancing. And they danced so hard, and they made so much noise that they attracted the police. 
They happened to party in the middle of the war. That's in France, middle of the Second World War. And he was killed because he was partying too hard and he was deported because he was Jewish. And when he arrived in the death camps in Auschwitz, he found that all his family has been deported, 40 people. And actually, over the course of the, the death camps that, that he experienced, all of them got either shot, starved to death, or they felt sick, or they killed themselves unless they were burnt in the gas chamber. And all that time, he, in, his, in, his, uh, in his paper that he wrote, he explained that he always felt that he had his dignity because he felt that he was making the choice of staying alive the whole time. And so when he sold, actually the reason why I have such a close relationship to him is because he sold, uh, so when he came out of the death camps, he actually bought the factory in which he used to work. He made the factory expand. He, he built many other factories. Actually, he built one of the first mechanical computers in France. And he became a multimillionaire. And I remember when I was a kid, uh, he, so he, he sold the house that my parents are living in now with three conditions. The first is that we cannot speculate, we cannot sell the house to make money. The second is that we always have to be hospitable. And the third, we have to dedicate our life to promote world peace. No pressure. <laughs> and, and so we embraced that. And so we, we, we took the house, and I remember when I was a kid, he took me once to one of his castles, and he was organizing a greyhound uh, race. And I was looking at this skinny Jewish guy with a cane and thought, wow, he teach me that I can be what I want to be, and I can change the world alone. I know it sounds, it sounds weird, I, I can change my world. And if I can change my world, it can change the world of people that are in my immediate surrounding, and it just keeps on re uh, having a ripple effect. And so it's with this very high spirit and inspiration that I felt in my yurt, minus 10 degrees in London, that I should aim in the worst moment for the highest. And so I applied for this 100,000 US dollar grant for Savannah Ocean Exchange, which is a, an oceanographic grant. And we got it. So, <laughs> yes. so moving from the yurt and flying to San Francisco, and uh, arrived there, spent two months, and realizing that the urban rate was too high, that we will again go without money if we, if we spend uh, as money, money as, we, as, we kept, as we kept going. We kept aiming even higher. And so we applied for uh, an incubator called Unreasonable at Sea, and we got it as well. And so, uh, slides please. So we got accepted to get on board of this ship. And so this ship is actually a floating university. 600 students, 50 faculties with their families, 200 staff, and 10 companies that want to change the world. With these, with these people, we've actually sailed around the world, and this is, the, this is how I came to Hong Kong. We set sail from San Diego, and I'm gonna take you around a journey around the world. So first stop, we crossed half of the Pacific, and we stopped uh, at, in, in Hilo Island. We drove down the south, and we arrived in, in, the, in the place called Camilo Beach. It's one of the most polluted beach on Earth. There's more plastic than sand. We estimate that there are 10 million of tons of plastic, up to hundreds of millions of tons. We actually really don't know. Second step, we arrived in, in uh, Japan. Actually, it was the second time I was going because my family, I'm half Japanese, are uh, coming from a place 100 kilometers away from Fukushima. So we drove all the way on the coast. And we've seen landscapes which look like moon. This was one of the most urbanized coastline in the world. It looks like a nuclear bomb just exploded there. Only a few structures remain. And so it was 20,000 people died immediately, but now 300,000 people cannot really go back to their home because they're afraid of radiation and because the conditions are improper for them to, to come back. And so we used our little boat that you, that you see here to start measuring radioactivity underwater. And the measurement that we found of radioactivity suggests that we should go again and investigate. So I'm going to go uh, to uh, Fukushima again for two weeks in October. But the, the instrument that, you, that we used here, as you, as you can see, are li getting a little bit more complicated. And so instead of having just a shape-shifting hull, we have to expand the system and maybe uh, authorize modularity. And so what you see here is a boat that has a, a, a first uh, module that's working like a locomotive of a train, and this one like a wagon. So for example, if we put here radioactivity sensors and we put here uh, fish sensors, then we could study the interaction between radioactivity and the fish. We could carry several missions at the same time. Uh, slides, please. Actually, it's better if you keep my slides on because I have many of them. <laughs> Can I have my slides back, please? Thank you. 
So we kept sailing, and we arrived in Vietnam. This is how like, some rivers look in, in Ho Chi Minh. This is even worse in India. 48 of 48 rivers, 100% of, of the rivers in Kerala, are, not, are improper now for bathing, fishing, uh, for, for anything. You can't do anything. This is really terrible. We kept sailing, arrived in Ghana, and we were lucky to get on board with the fishermen. And, and actually, they use very uh, traditional fishing techniques still. What they don't know is that they don't know what they're getting sick. Some of them were starting to lose their hair, have some skin problem. The reason is because just next to those guys, they're starting to exploit oil in a very intensive way. Only since three years. They have no oil preparedness, and they have no way to even sense and understand what's happening in the environment. This is my father, the third person I'd like to talk about. And the reason why I want to talk about him is because he inspired me to learn from places, things, and uh, people. <laughs> And the uh, reason is because he's Japanese, and he's a sculptor, and he believes that everything is alive, that everything is God. There's no, uh, not, nothing like a God there and things uh, or symbols of God. Everything is, it should be respected and should be cared for. And so talking to him is really what drove me to make this presentation, is that we can learn from, from all these things. After I had a discussion with my father, Strategically, I decided to move to Hong Kong and build a workshop in Yunlong, an office, and we start to have a really nice, vibrant community here. This is a hackathon we organize to teach people how to build uh, sailing robots. And um, I think Hong Kong is the best place in the world to do, uh, to do uh, ocean robotics because it's got the freedom of the West and the economic power from, from, from Asia. And we have also ma amazing manufacturing here next to, in, in Shenzhen, possibility of, of, of shipping. And there's so many unaddressed environmental problems in all this region. And, um, but we had one problem in Yunlong, is that we're a bit far away from uh, water. And actually, a couple of times, we were testing uh, boats. By the time we arrived uh, to the beach, there was no more wind. So we started building the same machine, trying to imitate the properties of a shape-shifting boat, but on land. And we're making more discoveries about the physics. And uh, the, the most interesting thing that I'd like to tell about this machine is not that it's super fast and cool and so on. It's actually how much energy it's using. So the exact same machine with the same mechanism. This one is six meters long. And it's tested here at the Science and Technology Park just uh, about a month ago. And what's amazing about this machine is trying to locate the motor. The motor is tiny. The motor is, is this, this size. The reason is uh, you, we're using this physics. When you're trying to park your car, it's really hard. You have lots of friction. As soon as your car is running, the smallest pinch on the wheel, and then you'll be off from the highway. So actually, the bigger the machine, and the more, uh, the more weight and the more uh, uh, speed it has, and the least energy we need. So we feel that we have a combination of shape-shifting hold that allows us to keep a better point of sale, and uh, modularity, and like uh, energy efficiency with this kind of experiment. So we, we think we're on a really good track to, to develop the, the best autonomous sailing robots in, in the world. Problems in the ocean are numerous, and they're not going to stop. Actually, you should feel concerned. This is Lama Island, last year. This is an oil spill that happened in Lama Island, and probably none of, very few of you have, have heard about it. We want to develop these machines on a larger scale, so we could, we could go and, and clean up oil spills. But if you have autonomous sailing robots, you could do tons of stuff. You could, you could protect fisheries and marine sanctuaries. You could map coral reefs. You could do all sorts of ocean science or even many other industrial applications. So now you've seen that this is kind of the experience I've been through in the last four years. I want to give you a few takeaways. The first is that if you want to do ocean science, we don't need to have huge, expensive ships that use fossil fuels and a huge number of crews. I hope that we can develop very energy efficient, autonomous sailboats that use renewable energy. The second is that we've been developing all this stuff that's, I think, quite cutting edge, all open source with very low budgets. And so I really plead you, if you think you have a good technology for the environment, I really think it should be available for everyone. Because seriously, the ocean is big enough for everyone to collaborate and, and make money out of it, if that's a concern. Making a project open source allows you to have not a product, but suddenly have a whole market. You allow people, other people to copy your technology and make it better, then you actually create not customers, but you create a community. And that's huge. That means that the people that you used to wait for them to go and, and, and complain at you, now they come to help you. They, they, they start to be contributors to your technology. 
That means that as well that many other companies that are emerging can no longer, you, you, you don't have to fear them as competitors, but they become um, uh, collaborators many, many of times. And if you are afraid of starting a company that you think is going to be very cost ineffective and it will remain local, well, if you do an open source again, you can scale up to a global way in, in, a, in a very fast fashion. So inventing cool new technologies is not what's going to cut it alone. Actually, technology is the easy part of my work. The, the hard part is to change the mindset. This is how we do business as usual. We're trying to make companies that make lots of money. We're using technology for that, and we employ human resource. Human are not really resource in my mind, but. And then we are making it green, just because actually many of times it can increase the, the price package. But this is not how the world works. If you don't have the environment, you cannot have human beings that are healthy and productive, and humans are technological animal, and money is just a form of technology. I believe that if we don't shift completely how we're doing business today, I don't see how we're going to make a sustainable society. So the ocean is where all life comes from, and I really believe this is our future. Right now, 90% of the world trade is transported by the ocean. Most of our information is transported by optical cables that are going underwater. We haven't started to tap at all in the food and energy capacity of the ocean. There is so much work to do in there. So I hope, I, I mean, I, I feel that we're on a, on a, on a really, a truly amazing journey, and I hope that will join us to explore and protect the ocean with open technologies. Thank you very much.